Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan Emmett Pitts. This is Ukraine War news update for the 1st of February 2024. Pinch and a punch for the 1st of the month, no returns. You hit me back. Uh, I, my voice is a little bit better today, that's fantastic. Um, I Just to let you know, a bit of housekeeping, that in the next few weeks, at some point, I'm suddenly going to not be able to give you the uh, news update in the way uh, that I'm doing right now, because I'll be in transit to Ukraine. Uh, I'm not saying exactly when that's going to be, but don't worry if I suddenly don't have uh, my normal video output that I do. I will try and schedule some content uh, to to give you something um, ahead of the ahead of the game, but yeah, just giving you a heads up there. Right, let's talk about the Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats apply. You can find the caveats in the description to the video below. We have some very high numbers in uh, a number of these categories, particularly personnel, 1,000 again. Uh, that is a, a really big uh, loss for the Russians. That indicates almost certainly that the Russians have been attacking in a number of places, and that's definitely true from what I can gather from the evidence, visual evidence and, and mapping changes and whatnot. So quite a bit of activity. But also, yesterday was talk about the Ukrainians hitting 12 um, troop accumulations, depots and bits, you know, targets like that, that could also lead towards a large personnel loss in a single day. So it's difficult to know whether that is Ukrainian strikes or Russian attacks that, that self retreat. Uh, or both, and almost certainly both. Right, 12 tanks, uh, 16 armoured personnel vehicles, so not the highest numbers we've seen, but fairly significant numbers of losses. Uh, just keep that attrition rate ticking along. 33 artillery systems is a high number to lose in a day. They are certainly working hard, the Ukrainians, on attriting the Russians in that category. Uh, we talked before about that could probably, possibly, but probably, given the really high numbers we've seen, include certain sizes of mortar. So it's not just artillery. Uh, it could be like 80 mil, 80, 80 mil plus mortars uh, that are included in those artillery system losses. Two multiple launch rocket systems, 36 vehicles and fuel tanks. Now, I'm going to show you evidence of uh, three Baba Yagas. I believe there are three, taking out a sort of warehouse depot with eighteen, ve uh, sorry, 11 vehicles in as far as I remember. So 11 vehicles in one hit, essentially. And you look at sort of 36, number 36, anything, that's surely not realistic in one day. You've got the whole of the front line. You've got just seemingly endless numbers of drones and drone operators active all across the front lines. And the drone, uh, those Baba Yaga drones are pretty effective at taking out uh, some fairly significant targets. So a, a, a depot with 11 vehicles, that's one hit. And then Novomikhailivka, there's footage I'm just about to show you of a convoy of Russian vehicles. I think that's maybe 11 vehicles, again, tanks and APVs taken out like that. So when you, when you see these consistently high numbers, you think that's surely not possible. It is very possible. And, and that leads us to believe that these statistics are at least somewhat accurate. That's, that's what I seek to do a day in day. Well, I don't seek to do that. I, I seek to find out whether they are accurate and the evidence seems to point to, to, towards the, the idea that they are. Uh, 10 special pieces of equipment or uh, pieces of special equipment is also a high number of losses in that category. Uh, so it could be excavators, um, Comms, comms equipment, so on and so forth. Right, Andrew Perpetua's list, as you can see, pretty extensive. Again, a lot of losses uh, that, that would go towards justifying these numbers. And of course, that says nothing about the Ukrainian losses. But the ratios have been very much in Ukraine's favor over the, if you spread it over the last few months. Yeah, there are certain days where there's parity or near parity. This is one of those days where it's about three to one uh, Russian to Ukrainian losses. Uh, that is... You know, at least what the Ukrainians will need going forward. Uh, when we look at these losses, let's go to the Ukrainians first. A number of boats, uh, they seem to lose a lot of boats at the moment. That is the risk of uh, having to cross at certain points of the river where the Russians will know they're going to cross, right? They, they're at Krinky. They're not going to go across five kilometers up from Krinky and walk all their, their equipment five kilometers because that's Russian territory. They're not going to uh, go five kilometers downstream to pick up injured people in Krinky. They need to get 
too cranky. So there's only a certain area of the river that they can cross. And if the Russians are hanging around there with drones, that's insanely dangerous, right? And so it's no surprise that we keep seeing boats sunk. I think it's just the nature of the beast. It's really unfortunate. Um, a couple of I I infantry fighting vehicles, a couple of BMPs, a couple of MRAPs, um, uh, and then the rest of the trucks and civilian vehicles. Uh, there's a decoy there that you can effectively take off the list and an unknown MTLB. I guess that's purple because it doesn't know whether it's Ukrainian or Russian. That's the nature of the beast when you're considering that the Ukrainians use the same equipment as the Russians. So you've got BMP 1s, 2s and 3s. Uh, both sides use them. You see one that's completely burnt out in a place that's a grey zone. You're like, who knows who lost that? Who Whose that was? And especially when you have one side capturing the vehicles of the other side and using them. So sometimes I, I'm surprised we don't see that more often, to be perfectly honest. Right, so that's not particularly high value equipment. Obviously, there are people involved in that. And so the people are incredibly high value. So when, you, when you lose a, a boat, you know, you're going to lose people as well. But in terms of high value equipment, uh, that's not not the worst day for Ukraine. Now, if we look at the Russian losses, we've got an excavator. So that's one of your bit, bits of special equipment. No sur surveillance and comms stuff there that we normally see. Uh, artillery, some BM-21 grads. So a couple of multiple launch rocket systems, uh, which again, you know, going back to the general staff figures, two of those lost and two of them uh, appear on here. Um, some other artillery, a few tanks there. Uh, uh, some BMP infantry fighting vehicles and a number of MTLB uh, armor personnel vehicles and then trucks and civilian uh, vehicles here. Now, as you can see, Baba Yaga um, being responsible for a number of these civilian vehicles that were destroyed. So we'll, we'll return to that in a second. Before, uh, okay, the... The end result of looking at those stats is that the Russians have lost a lot more stuff than the Ukrainians. And that is the kind of day um, that the Ukrainians will like. You know, they, they will need these days every day in order to get the Russians to a point where there's a tipping point and the Russians just don't have, they're losing too much equipment. Um, when that day will be, we don't know. We know that they are putting stuff out of storage faster than they ever have done uh, at the moment. Now, this came out yesterday, uh, and I could include this in the strikes section because this is a, a, as a result of strikes on Belbek Air Base. But there are some people who are calling this into question uh, due to the sourcing of it. Uh, so just take this with a pinch of salt. The idea is that in the strikes on Belbek, uh, and we know the airbase was struck, and we know there's smoke coming out off the airbase. So th this is entirely plausible. And you could argue even probable, but the idea is that there were three jets that were lost uh, and 20 personnel, possibly even um, uh, special forces there. At the Belbeck Airfield, according to verified information, three aircraft, two Su-27 and one Su-30 were lost. Two of them were seriously damaged, but there's still a chance to repair them. Uh, one plane, unfortunately, was completely destroyed. The missile hit it directly. Also, 12 military personnel were killed uh, at and near the airfield and more than 10 were injured. Um, some of the t planes did not have time to take off after receiving a signal about a missile threat. In this regard, we suffered such heavy losses, uh, said our source in the Ministry of Defence. Now, the, the point is that this, um, this source is not reliable. Um, you know, bad news from Crimea. And, and as you can see here, you know, there's evidence that Belbek was hit. Uh, but you know, don't take that as a given that those uh, planes were lost. In fact, no reports was very clear on this. Yes, for now, this is rumor uh, spreading on Telegram without any form of verification cannot be stated as fact. In general, anyone should be careful of taking screenshots where the sender or channel has been deliberately erased as a valid source. Well, actually, they do know the source now. Um, and then here's the source, but then isn't uh, particularly uh, confident with that source to be perfectly fair and indeed you know um uh, yeah actual source is that and he says it's unreliable dimitri from all translated also stated that that was a very unreliable source but it may still have happened and all all the there's nothing to disconfirm that really happening um and it would fit in line with the fact that the airbase was struck but then if you're using storm shadow missiles i don't know that you would use them against I've wondered about this before. You guys can let me know in the threads. But if you have a, a number of of parked airplanes, right, that are that are that are sitting there, usually when you send missiles off, which was kind of 
hinted at in in the source here there's good um lead time between when you uh, when you understand the missiles are in the air and when they're going to hit the target and so you get your planes up quickly they can then circle in the helicopters as well they can then circle uh, so the air air bases well the, the missiles won't hit the planes and then the missiles hit the runway and then you go oh dear that's a shame you land somewhere else or you land on the runway depending on how it is but you don't lose the planes uh, and missiles like the storm shadows and scalps are the kind of bunker buster missiles and i don't think the uh the best use of them is to strike at targets that are effectively time sensitive so they're more likely to be used on things like the tra air traffic control towers and you know your bases maybe you would want to hit the um the the billeting for the pilots you know if you can take out 10 pilots in their in their barracks or wherever then that's going to be a super useful use of that missile but if you're going to fire it at a plane and then that plane takes off then you have wasted millions of dollars worth of of missile or however much it, it is so it, it it's probably although i say there's a high probability this could happen actually uh, you know we should probably revise that i should probably be a, a little less sloppy and say realistically that they aren't going to be trying to hit um airplanes i don't think but then that is just what do i know type thing uh nonetheless you know there were many uh, targets that were hit i would have thought across crimea i say i would have thought because the russians have claimed they've taken down every single missile and um, we'll come to that into next in the next section now talking about losses this is a video that's doing the rounds at the moment and it's quite incredible Right, so we're looking at it from the very beginning, but basically it's a, a video of a failed assault, I think, south of uh, Nova Makalivka. Yeah, southwest of Nova Makalivka. So we'll we'll maybe have a look at that on the frontline update later. But yeah, this took place and it was just a, it's an incredible video, this, because you are seeing one after the other uh, Russian vehicle being taken out, taken out, taken out. Uh, just as I say incredible and unsurprisingly it's not going to load now because you know that's my luck uh let's look at it again here so that is the image you kind of need to see to understand how many vehicles the russians send in and how close together some of these are right imagine you are using um artillery i mean you could arguably take out three vehicles in one i mean that is not good uh tactics or not good protocol for these uh these russians anyway there's a lot of vehicles here and we have the ukrainians interestingly hitting almost all of them with first person view drones rather than with artillery and i think that tells you a lot about a lack of artillery shells but possibly the prevalence of um of drones and and how that they appear to have far more drone uh munitions and and far more drones than they do artillery shells but just each one of these that t72 tank you know each one of those is a hit on a vehicle in that column and it appears that they have taken out every single one of those vehicles with first person view drones and uh, you know the video goes on i uh, you go and watch the video uh, i'll get in trouble for showing all of that but but just huge amount of devastation caused by uh a, a large number of drones hitting these these vehicles so then when you go back to look at the general star figures and you're like 12 tanks really 16 apvs really yeah well 11 of those were taken out in one place you know by uh drone operators in that one area it's just quite incredible um so and it, talking about that video the Russians have reacted very badly to it. So here you can see, you know, lots of smoking um, vehicles there. Uh, these were all hit by the, those drones. The destruction of the Russian convoy in Novomikhailivka area by the 72nd Brigade. The Russian command has uh, uh, peanuts instead of brains. It's almost unbelievable. Well, actually, they've reacted to this. So this is 
uh, a comment on a Russian channel to this. The enemy video, today's attempt by our soldiers to advance in the Nova Mikhailivka area. I honestly don't know how to comment on this. How can you not take into account the fact of FPV drones on January the 30th, 2024, being an Admiral General drawing a plan of attack? Where is the experience from the Ukrainian Armed Forces summer counteroffensive attempt? How can you afford to lose so much equipment in a day? So many people. Complete stupidity and incompetence. At the moment, the Russian armed forces do not have any massive protection against enemy drones. Everything they install has long been outdated and does not cover the enemy's new frequencies. I've talked about this before, about how they can you get countermeasures. Uh, you, you put a request into to manufacture a load of countermeasure devices. You install them on your vehicles and you keep making them for six months, but actually they're obsolete within a month because the Ukrainians are onto it and, and are producing, you know, those um, munitions that defy those countermeasures already. And uh, the, there isn't enough reactivity to the Russian uh, production schedules. Um, only volunteer projects are now on the way. Large factories have not been able to launch small electronic warfare and are sitting with gravy in their pants in front of the minister and the ZMO. The problem requires emergency measures. P.S. Now in the comments, the reality of the idiots who have already defeated all the Ukrainians will burst. And all these uh, are tipso videos. I don't know what that means. And of course, the patriots on the salary will squeal that the video was filmed uh, who knows how long ago. And in general, you're all lying. Start assholes in other words that last paragraph says basically don't criticize the, re the your reaction will be oh this was filmed days ago or this was this or this was that and that's your way of getting around it and it, or lying or whatever but this is the reality this has happened and there needs to be a response to this but there at the moment doesn't look like there is any meaningful response to uh to the threat of these drones on russian vehicles and i think you know if you're pro Ukrainian, this is a good thing to see. So yesterday or the last 48 hours, I think that might have actually happened as mentioned on the 30th. So the last 48 hours has been very good as we've seen from the statistics for Russian losses. And Andrew Perpetua says, Russia, how's it going? Russia answers this. And he says, they lost so many, it is making me dizzy. How are they so bad at this? You know, and Andrew's job if you like what he does on a daily basis is look at every bit of video footage on his team uh, all all across the front lines and he gets a good grasp on what's going on and this is not good for russia they, this is you know pro kremlin voices in my threads you know how's it going how's your two day how's your three day smo going because it doesn't look good to me and then when you're looking forward in, in when you look at see what Budanov says about how the Ukrainian the Russian counteroffensive or the Russian offensive phase is not going well and it's going to peter out by the, by spring it's like yeah I think Budinov is, is pretty close to the mark here. They can't sustain that for much longer. And it's really interesting that Kamishin, top knot guy, if you remember, um, says 2024 will be the year of drones. Right? And he produces stats. I would like to know where they got these from, whether they're dipping into uh, you know, the Tochny stats and, and whatever. But he says, over the past few months, Ukraine has been conducting more FPV drone strikes than Russia. However, a detailed analysis shows that Ukraine drones n do not outnumber Russian in strikes on all types of targets. Russia uses more drones and strikes on defensive fortifications than Ukraine. So go back and watch that video I did with Tochny where we, we talk about that in great detail. They've got the data on that. But what is important is how much the Ukrainians outnumber strikes on vehicles over the Russians. And I've said over the last few days, I've repeated it, that it's likely because the Russians can't find the targets for the, to strike with drones. So they're having to strike uh, infantry uh, dugouts and trenches more than the Ukrainians because the Ukrainians aren't committing vehicles to the front line because they're not on the offensive. And actually, when they did do that, they did lose a lot of stuff mainly to not to drones so much as to artillery and ATGMs and, and helicopters. But 1,984 drone strikes on vehicles from the Ukrainians against 616. So that is over a three to one ratio. And th so when you then go back to this statistic and this statistic, you get a sense that, yeah, this all does marry. Everything does seem to be, you know, pretty kosher with regard to should, are we justified in believing those stats? Now, the, the key question is what are the Ukrainian 
troop losses and that's something we just don't know are they in any way comparable to the russian troop losses because the ukrainians are getting hit more than the russians in terms of strikes on infantry and on positions however it is fairly comparable there strikes on infantry 1772 1745 so the ukrainians still have a marginal advantage there it's the strikes on positions and i don't know how they differentiate strikes on positions against strikes on troops because actually the positions are positions of infantry usually when you're striking a trench and when you're striking a dugout what you're really doing is take taking out the infantry who are there uh, for the ukrainians 50 against 505 so the russians are striking 10 times more uh, positions than the ukrainians and that will that will have an effect on um on the ukrainian ability to commit to their defensive war so on and so forth but I think that's a fascinating statistic. The total, the Ukrainians are 3,806 to 2,886. It, that's a significant advantage still. I mean, although you might not think that's huge in, in this war, when you then add it together with the vehicle hits, I think the, the Ukrainians will almost certainly be doing a consistently bad, um, you know, hurting the Russians consistently heavily with with their particularly their drones and that's not to talk about counter battery fire uh, and missile strikes and so on and so forth um now here's the attack with the baba yaga drones that were listed in andrew perpetua's list here uh, you know if you remember that uh talked about that garage being hit uh baba yaga drones all down there those vehicles well actually here, here is the evidence of that consequence of an attack on of a Ukrainian Baba Yaga drone on a fuel warehouse and a parking lot full of Russian cars. In total, reportedly, 11 cars were destroyed, two Russians were killed and several were wounded. And these are, you know, Bakanka vans and other vehicles, uh, SUVs that were being used by the Russians um, and, yeah, taken out not to be used again. Uh, the drone called Baba Yaga still remains a big problem for the Russian armed forces. It's hardly affected by the Groja electronic warfare system, creating only interference, but not a complete loss of control. Also, anti-drone guns are ineffective. So that's that's uh, fascinating. The photo shows the result of an attack by three Baba Yaga drones on a fuel warehouse and a vehicle parking lot uh, of one of the artillery units, of the armed forces. And then you're thinking, well, will this affect the, uh, the artillery units? You know, will they have a lack of ammunition? Will they have a lack of fuel to be able to move their artillery around? So on and so forth. You know, how, what effect does that have directly on the front line? Then we can go to this, a Forbes article, again, again Forbes, David Axe at Forbes doing a fabulous job of, of documenting the war. The Ukrainian Marines hit the Russian Marines so hard they blew the Russians back to 1980. What's this about? So in 1980, the Soviet Navy's 810th, so these are guys who have been operating around Kherson recently, Krinky. For the Russians, the 810th Guards Naval Infantry Brigade, uh, so Marines, based in Sevastopol on Ukra Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula, owned a battalion of 1950s vintage T-55 T tanks back in 1980. In 2024, so right now, the Russian Army Navy's 810th Guards Naval Infantry Brigade, fighting in Kherson or Blast in southern Ukraine, owns a battalion of... 1950s vintage t-55 tanks and not the same t-55s no the 810th brigade went to war in ukraine in february 2022 with reasonably modern t-80 tanks but then the brigade got destroyed twice by ukrainian troops and lost many if not all of its t-80s i'm trying to think if the 810th was around in vukladar i know it was was the 44th was there i don't know the 810th were there as well uh, so the brigade, like much of the Russian military, travelled back in time and re-equipped the old with old weapons. The Kremlin pulled out long-term stories. Yeah, 110th Brigade's T-55s appeared in a recent report from Russian TV news program Zvezva. Um, now, how the 810th got blown back to the 1980s is no secret. The 2,500-person brigade, once considered elite, was in northern Kherson Oblast when Ukrainian forces launched their first major counteroffensive in the autumn of 2022. In mid-September 2022, the Ukrainian general staff claimed the 810th brigade was down to 15% of its original manpower, so it had been effectively wiped out. Uh, and the survivors were refusing to fight. The Kremlin reconstituted the brigade in late 2022 and early 2023 and redeployed it back to southern Ukraine, this time to Zaporizhia Oblast, east of Kherson. 
Uh, it goes on to say later, the Russian units on the left bank, uh, so basically it's been, you know, reconstituted twice. The Russian units on the left bank, the 810th and the 104th uh, Air Assault Division and attached army regiments together have lost at least 157 vehicles, so that's visually confirmed, including at least 19 tanks. By now, the 810th probably has lost and replaced several times all three dozen or so tanks in its original tank battalion. It's apparent that the Kremlin no longer can generate enough 43-ton three-person T-80s fully to replace the T-80s the 810th Brigade keeps losing. Uh, it goes on to talk about, you know, Oryx and uh, visual confirmation and T-55s and whatnot. But, you know, there's an example of cycling through a vast number of tanks that we have seen from visual evidence and then, you know, Russian TV news showing that brigade driving around not in the T-80s but in T-55s. Again, it's piecing together all these bits of the jigsaw. What position are the Russians in? What position are the Ukrainians in? The Ukrainians are finding it really difficult with not having that massive package of, of assistance from the US and not having enough artillery on the front lines. But man, they're still doing an admirable job in attriting the Russians. And they're doing that largely with drones at the moment. Now, the Russians destroyed a decoy launcher of the German-supplied RST SLM air defense system using Iskander-M or Tornado S-strikes in Lizna, Kharkiv region. Decoys were located in the place where um, on the sec 24th of February 2022, four Ukrainian S-300 launchers as well as uh, a 5N66M radar were destroyed. So right back at the beginning of the war during that suppression of enemy air defenses, there were some there were some Ukrainian high value air defense pieces blown up and radars blown up. So then I presume the U Ukrainians have said, right, let's now put our decoys in that position to make it look like, oh, we're back to using that place that we know is a really useful place for um for placing our air defense systems. And then it is blown up by um, what looks like some kind of ballistic trajectory. I mean, that's coming in a very steep angle right from uh, from above and blowing that up with a fairly significant explosion. Um, but it, unfortunately for the Russians, this was a decoy being blown up with Iskanders. And as Getty here says, the cost of one Iskander is $3 million and the mock air defense costs $10,000. And this is a good return on investment for that, for that defense. Even though, you know, you look at these and you think that's a bloody good, is it worth spending all that money on decoys? Actually, yeah, it still is because th that decoy... And here's one with a rotating radar. You know, this is a decent bit of decoy kit here, but it's not a fully functioning radar that would cost like millions. This is uh, just let's get something that rotates and looks pretty good from a drone and you, you'd struggle to... I mean, I'm looking at that from literally from right next to it and I wouldn't know that as a decoy. Like, I, like to me, I, I, I know Jack, right? So I was like, yeah. Oh my goodness, look, there's a really expensive bit of radar or whatever. Actually, it's not. And uh, and that's been blown up by decoys. Now, both sides are, are doing this. Both sides are involved in using decoys, of course. And I've said before that, my goodness, if you could spend a couple of million dollars on getting a shed load of decoys and that will save you, no doubt, millions and millions, not just in the opportunity cost of saving of, of not having your own expensive kit destroyed. So the capability of that and the replacement cost of that kit but also in wasting the enemy's missiles. So say, you know, three three million dollars a pop, you've just sent a couple of missiles against that battery. Um, that's cost you six million dollars and it's cost us ten thousand dollars. So yeah, really, really good use of of um of money to really in in buying these decoys. As uh, as you can see here, uh, documented by Dead District uh, has looked at this uh, and yeah, shown shown the decoys as well. So yeah, good stuff there from, in this in this case, the Ukrainians. Now, moving on to uh, the Liberty of Russia Legion, claiming to uh, be responsible for disrupting production of uh, at a metal plant in the city of Perm. So what's gone on here, um, the about the actions by partisans of the Legion Free Re Freedom of Russia in Perm. On Monday, partisans of the Legion booby-trapped the gatehouse of the 
Permetal plant. The products of the plant are used by Putin's military industry for strikes on peaceful cities of Ukraine. The partisans specify that ordinary workers of Russian industrial enterprises bear less responsibility in comparison to those who launch missiles at schools and hospitals and participate in the occupation with weapons in their hands. However, they are still responsible. Russian military factories are legitimate targets of the resistance movement. The bombing was just a warning from the partisans. The explosive device was not detonated. They didn't want to harm any ordinary workers, but they wanted everyone to hear them. The partisans also warned that attacks on Russian military industry will be deployed throughout the country. The management of the death factories will be destroyed by drones from the air, by explosives on the ground, in a dark entranceway or in a bright office. Really, I, I find this quite fascinating. Like, the cynic might say uh, it didn't explode because something went wrong and this is how they're using, this is their kind of excuse. But actually, what what that um, message says, I think is super important. You know, we can place bombs here and we will place bombs here and we stop production there as you've all walked around looking for, bo looking for um, devices and whatnot. We will continue to do this and next time we will blow things up. And then it's the message that sends to all the workers who are involved in that. It's, you know, especially coming from fellow Russians. This isn't Ukrainians. This is a freedom of Russia legion saying that this sucks. This is morally unacceptable. And we're going to we're going to blow you up. And it also you know, says to gets the Russians to then start having to apply resources into making sure that their factories are safe, so on and so forth. Um, Ukraine resistance group Atesh. These are, I think, predominantly uh, Tatars in Crimea. Uh, but anyway, they obviously not just that, because in the Tambov region, they've managed to set fire to a relay cabinet. Uh, they say the railway is used to transfer missiles to the arsenal of the Russian air and space forces. Um, so that kind of stuff continues on a, on a daily basis, pretty much. Trade pavilion is on fire in Krasnodar, so another kind of Russia on fire. Initially, the area is 250 square uh, square meters, not kilometers. That'd be mental. Uh, so, yeah, fires are still a thing. Um, and here we have War Translated um, translating what's going on in... I didn't know where to include this. Probably should be in the other section. But just to remind you that Putin... I think I... Do I have this? Do I have Putin saying this later? No. Um Putin very publicly yesterday uh, talked about how the Russians are have taken 19 buildings in Avdivka, which is that Dutch area near the Tsarska or Hota restaurant in the south of Avdivka. Now, Putin's come out and said, well, hey, look at us. We've taken 19 build 19 houses. Right. And you're like, is that what it's come to? Is that what you're shouting about? Goodness me. Is that is that is that? Where you're at two years into a war and you're the second greatest army in the world, we've taken 19 houses in Avdivka. whoop de freaking do after four months of attacking Avdivka. That is dead. And, you know, it's, it's embarrassing. It is genuinely embarrassing. Um, even the biggest Nazi among Zed morons uh, change rhetoric, says uh, War Translated. They dug a crap tunnel for 100 days so they can now, quote, heroically hold defense in Saska Ochota. Uh, Putin said they captured 19 buildings. Oh, lol. Absolutely. Their Avdivka operation is now closing in on four months. It's just, it is pretty embarrassing. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, <sighs> As this source says, objectively, it has become more difficult to fight the enemy. The enemy uses artillery to a minimum without revealing firing points. This Take into account everything that's said here, because there are some really uh, fascinating nuggets coming out of this. So they don't use artillery too much, using it as a minimum. That could be a lack of artillery ammunition, of course. But it also means they don't reveal their firing points too easily. Uh, compensating for this with massive use of drones. Again, going back to what was previously said, it looks like the strategy of the Ukrainian armed forces going on the defensive using drones. Fairy tales about a shortage of sh shells. 
it, how much of that is psyops that that's the implication here it's very convenient minimal firing points observation posts work of invisible operators with drone remote controls the plan is to hold the defense like this for a long time and while we advance waiting for arrivals i'm more concerned about our strategy rejection of primitive tactics and preservation of people are relevant in other words what we are doing is primitive tactics where we just kill all our people we don't care about uh, the preservation of our people and he says rejection of that is relevant in other words we should reject that bringing assault on on embrasures to a minimum like I, I, what i take from that is we aren't um uh you know we shouldn't be doing what we're doing at the moment uh just these these attacks on places that just exhaust our troops and equipment uh, for no real significant gain uh, russian forces on the other hand have shelled sumi oblast i was speaking to greg uh Greg Terry today, he is in Sumi Oblast, and he says it is mental there. The, like, on the line confirmation that they've really stepped up the shelling. Um, uh, Russian military shelled northeast and Sumi Oblast 216 times in 43 separate attacks throughout yesterday, according to Sumi Oblast mili military administration. Absolutely true. It is, it is hard. I think the whole front line is hard. It is hard for the Ukrainians. But even given the hardness, and Greg's going to be telling you it's hard because he's speaking to people on the front line all the time. And when you speak to those individuals, it's like speaking to those people in Crinky. They will tell you that life is hell and it's terrible and it's all suicidal. What, what's the point of this all? When you zoom out and understand what's going on everywhere, you can get actually a much better picture of what's going on. And in each individual place, it would be hell for anyone on both sides there. You're fighting a freaking war. It's horrible. No one likes it. And you will say your conditions are terrible and that the people are dying and it's all horrible. But when you look at the statistics, and this is translating human lives into numbers, yes. But when you want a grasp of what's going on, where we are at in the war at the moment, those attrition levels are still in favour of the Ukrainians. And, and I think we, we need to remember that. So as bad as it is for the Ukrainians and as terrible it is that they don't have all the equipment they need, they're still doing a really good job of Russians, in my opinion. Uh, on to strikes. Sorry, this is another going to be another long one, isn't it? I just talked too much. Overnight, Russia has used four drones. Two were shot down. 50% uh, not brilliant, but only four. So why so few drones? That, that same question. Uh, Russia did hit hospital, a hospital in Kharkiv yesterday, which is all fairly controversial. Uh, there was not a lot of footage coming out of this, um, uh, and they weren't releasing lots of information. So I think this is probably a fairly bad hit. Uh, it's a hospital, though. Jesus, what are you doing? Uh, quote, one was near, one was a direct hit. 38 people were evacuated from the hospital, including 33 patients, uh, of, uh, of which two were bedridden. Um, there were victims in that strike, but the police say they won't reveal the full details until the morning. I've not heard anything since then, but yeah, I think that's a, uh, not cool. And Russia's also been mercilessly hitting, as Tim White said, Kherson uh, in the afternoon and evening. Central areas have been pounded. It's pretty miserable, Kherson at the moment it is being hammered by the Russians and has been since it was um, liberated. An apartment block has reportedly been hit. It's purely residential there, but the power grid has also been damaged. Uh, there's no doubt they're just indiscriminately hitting civilian infrastructure in that area particularly. The Russian installed head of Occupy Crimea said yesterday more than six missiles were shot down. He also claims only minor damage from falling debris. So this was as a result of the wave of attacks that took place yesterday during the day uh, on uh, Belbek Air, Air Base and lots of places around Crimea. I indeed, there, there's evidence of air defense working. Explosions reported in, or not working, but not necessarily being successful. We're not, uh, not sure. Air defense was operating. Um, and then, as 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 we heard previously, perhaps um, there were three Russian air, air uh, jets taken out. But don't really know. But no reports says three Su-24 bombers carrying Storm Shadows or Scalp took off from St Starokos Santinev. So this was a cruise missile attack. Commander of the Ukrainian Air Force Oleschuk appears to confirm Ukrainian strikes targeting Russian Belbek Air Base in Crimea. Um, Ukrainian 204th Sevastopol Tactical Air Aviation Brigade was stationed there um, and they fly um, MiG-29 jets. So again, does that track with the jets that were claimed to be destroyed? Um, but something was hit there anyway. Um, it appears uh, something burning in at Belbek Air Base. And then this is so some of the places that were at least 
these places were struck yesterday. Uh, some sort of explosion reported in five places during the air raid on occupied Crimea. Um, Simfropol, uh, Saki, Sevastopol, Fyodosia, and um, up here as well, uh, uh, hit with uh, storm shadows or, cru or cruise missiles there at least. Um, strikes on an occupied Donetsk last night, uh, video showing uh, an electricity substation being on fire and power surges and outages reported in Donetsk and Makivka as well. Some explosions in the distance. So targets being hit, who knows what with, whether it's uh, just that kind of area. It could be all sorts of stuff because it's fairly close to the front line. Uh, are the GLSDBs being used yet? Who knows? Um, then Russia says it stopped two drones in Nizhny Novgorod. That's in Russia. Uh, last night, it claims they were flying low to avoid detection but was stopped by electronic warfare in the Kostovsky region. Indeed, this morning they said 11 drones were shot down over multiple regions in Russia. Russia keeps saying 100% of stuff is shot down. Like, Ukraine hardly ever say that. But, and if they do say it, it's, it's in amongst days like last night, 50%. The night before, over 50%. The night before that, less than 50%. Russia is like 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%. 100% and then you're like, how do you lose that? How do you lose that? Lose that entire warship? Like if you shot down 100 percent and stuff, like there's a submarine that's blown up there. What's happened to that S400 system and those radars? Like it's just interesting because those drones conveniently get shot down into the target they're aiming for. How does that work, Russia? How does that work? Oh yeah, you're lying. That was it. Um, so, yeah, I just don't believe him. Uh, Pro-Ukraine channel, channel Crimea Wind reports one of its subscribers writing, In Saki, explosions are heard in the direction of Yepatoria. No surprise there. Those things are almost certainly here. Jake Bro talking about how it's very apparent that Ukraine's main objective is for 2024. We talked about this previously a number of times. These drone strikes on oil depots on the Baltic seas will never be stopped. Russia can't stop them. Russia will still be able to export oil and gas by land through Asia and through the Arctic Ocean. But Russia's export days using the Baltic and Black Seas are about to be ended. Uh, a very positive view from Jake Bro there. But... Yeah, Ukraine are going to be doing that. Now, the Ukrainians have released figures of what the Russians have in terms of their missile inventory. Here it is claimed that the Russian Federation currently has more than 800 missiles, including 63 daggers, uh, evidenced by the data collected by Ukrainian war infographics. Now, okay, first question is, is this accurate? Who knows? Let's say it is accurate. Babiats, blah, blah, blah. You might look at that and go, Ooh, 800 missiles, that's quite a lot of missiles. They've got 375 of those. They've got 63, 63 daggers. They're Kinjau hypersonic missiles. 800 missiles is nothing. Like Iskander's 375 is nothing. Like They have dwindled their supplies down to critically low numbers. What Russia have to be aware of is... is having a strategic reserve of missiles in case they go to war with another nation. If they go to war with NATO, they have 800 missiles to try and take out 30 NATO countries. Ain't going to happen. When you just look at Russia, uh, sorry, the US, when we look at one type of uh, cruise missile here, uh, the JASM cruise missile, the US have 3,600 of those due to be in place by 2016. So I don't know, somewhere at least, uh, probably around two to 3,000 right now, JASM. That's just one of their types of cruise missiles. One type of cruise missile, not Tomahawks, JASM. They've got more JASMs by a couple of times than Russia's entire missile inventory. When you look at um, Tomahawks, their cruise missile, that's just another type of cruise missile. I'm not even talking ballistic missiles like ATACMs. How many ATACMs they got? 4,000, I think, ATACMs. 4,000 ATACMs. How many um, Tomahawks? Again, it's 4,000 that the Navy operate. Not the Air Force, not the Army. The US Navy have 4,000 Tomahawks. 800 missiles, if that is true, is pitiful. They are firing missiles into Ukraine at the rate they produce them, and they have dwindled their stocks to be at absolutely shocking levels. If they were to go to war with another nation at the moment, if they went to war with, with Poland at the moment, I keep saying this, Poland would 
defeat Russia, particularly in a, in a land war, you know, nuclear notwithstanding. This is critical for Russia, and they are clearly not. I mean, you can go and look up on on the internet how many cruise missiles and ballistic missiles that the, the U.S. has, but it puts the Russian stocks to absolute shame. Um, and that's just one nation, right? Um, going to other bits and pieces, I've been called out repeatedly on spreading rumors and hearsay about Zelensky. Zelensky, literally. Every single news outlet is now reporting it and they're all using their own sourcing, although some of those sources might be the same, but they've gone to them independently. Um, a number of sources, and as I said, Denis Davidov, who is a YouTuber, has his own sources and c confirms this is true. And in fact, politicians are coming out and saying that th this is true. Um, CNN piling on to confirm, says Shashank Joshi. The Ukraine's popular army chief, Zaluzhny, was called to a meeting uh, to the president's office on Monday and he was being uh, told he's being fired. Presidential decree is expected by the end of the week, one of the sources told. Now, the issue for me here that, that well, what kind of supports this claim is the fact that it has been a couple of days now and no one's come out and officially denied it. It was initially denied by um, one of the offices uh, that, that put out a really, like, pithy tweet on, on the subject. Uh, but actually, after that, no one has said anything. And if, if, if this was absolutely untrue, this is like 100% not true, then someone would have come out and told you this is not true. Instead, all we heard immediately was, dear journalists, an immediate answer to everyone, no, this is, this is not true. And that was like came out straight away when the when the um and from the defense ministry uh when it was kind of when the news came out, but Zelensky hasn't denied it. He said nothing about it in his evening speeches, and Zeluzhny's not said anything. And there are all these claims that seem pretty bona fide that that did actually happen. They did have a meeting that Zeluzhny was calm, um, but refused to go, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. You know, again, prob if you're doing a probability assessment, I all I'm doing is saying, right, this is not 100% true. My assessment is that it is very probably true to some degree. Uh, whether the kickback to this will change Zelensky's decision is something else to discuss. It might not happen based on the uh, the Ferrari that's come out of that. Okay. Uh, you might impress. Ukraine returns home 207 POWs. So this is a second large-scale prison exchange with Russia of this year already. Among those were defenders of Mariupol and Snake Island, and POWs are from all main sectors of the front. But none of the POWs swapped were from the names that were released on the uh, lists of POWs to do with the Ill-76 plane that was shot down. Of course, if Russia had released any of those POWs, straight away people would have been, well, you're lying, clearly lying. So they were never going to release, oops, they were never going to release the um, the prisoners that were on those lists. It's not going to happen. So anyway, really good. This is a significant prisoner exchange. Um, Moscow has relocated 100,000 Russians to occupied Melitopol. This is a way of uh, essentially changing the demographic makeup of the occupied territories so that they become more russified moving russians to crimea is something was it a million russians since 2014 have been moved to crimea and then you say oh you know someone like elon musk says you should do a poll of crimea it's like if you did a poll of crimea now and said do you want to remain russian it would say yes we want to remain russian because you've just shipped in a million russians right how about getting the people from crimea who had to run away because the russians took it over so it's, the polls are very dangerous because of the nature of what Russia do, which is move Russians in and change the demographic makeup of these places and go, oh, look, everyone speaks Russian here. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. Um, occupiers are uprooting Ukrainians, relocating thousands of migrant workers from Russia and reshaping the nation's gene pool, emphasise the mayor. This is really insidious. And as far as I believe, I think it's a war crime as well. I'm fairly sure that goes against the Geneva Convention. For certainly the forced deportation. So they're, they're filtering, filtering filtration camps in Russia, moving out the Ukrainians, putting them into Russia, which again kind of Russifies those Ukrainians, and then takes takes ethnic Russians in and puts them into the occupied territories and Russifies those territories. It's like, yeah, no. 
Uh, the UN court has ruled that Russia broke international anti-terrorism financing treaty. Back from 2014, Russia has violated an international convention on prohibiting terrorist financing by supporting its proxies in, in Ukraine's Donetsk and Luhansk blasts. In 2014, according to UN International Court of Justice in The Hague, yesterday, and I wonder what the ramifications of that will be in terms of Russia's membership of the UN Security Council. It would be great if they, they just kicked, kicked off the UN Security Council. Please do it. Um, <laughs> Margarita Simonian said in 2022... We will. Do, this is what I was referring to earlier. Simon Yan said in 2022, we will defeat Ukraine in two days. Two years later, in 2024, Putin says, we captured 19 houses in Avdivka in four months. Ooh. In fact, either way, I don't think that's his exact words, but the point, point is, we've been fighting for months in Avdivka, and this, he, he publicly announced that they caught, captured 19 houses. How's it going, Russia? Well, you doing a good job? Yeah, not too sure. Um, okay, and finally this from Anton Gerashchenko, an in interesting little um, observation and analysis. Russia, Russians are being prepared for an internet blackout after Putin's election. So we've seen internet blackouts take place a lot recently in a number of places. So preparations are being carried out under the legend of fine-tuning anti-drone systems, which in fact have no effect on drones. Yesterday, a drone was spotted over St. Petersburg, despite the military's claims that they shot it down. It managed to fly to the Nevsky district, exploding on the territory of the Nevsky Mazut oil refinery. A week before that, two drones attacked Novatex terminals in the port of Usluga. Before that, the city shut down mobile internet for several nights in a row, formally precisely to counter the drones. Meanwhile, unexplained internet outages are occurring in various regions of Russia. After thousands of people went on uh, out on January the 17th to protest the jailing of eco-activist Fal Alsinov, WhatsApp, Telegram, uh, and I think it was Signal, but certainly WhatsApp and Telegram were blocked in Bashkortostan. In some districts of Yakutia, after the inter-ethnic unrest that broke out in the region, mobile internet disappeared altogether. As Sakaday reports, as a result, terminals for payment and bank cards did not work in stores and public transportation and orders could not be distributed at Ozon marketplace points. Later in Leningrad, Sukhov and Novgorod regions from January the 25th to the 30th, 4G mobile internet was switched off. The Russian authorities claim that the work was carried out by order of the Ministry of Digital Development, Communications and Mass Media for the needs of law enforcement agencies in particular to fine-tune anti-drone systems. However, as we can see, the drone flights over the region were not affected in any way. So the real reason may be quite different. Preparations to shut down or seriously slow down the internet throughout Russia, or at least in the largest cities. On Tuesday, January the 30th, a massive disruption of the work of internet providers and mobile operators was already observed throughout Russia. Users across the country reported problems with access to Yandex search engines, uh, V Contactor, social network, Ozone and Wildberries marketplaces, RuTube video platform. So I was talking about how this could be as a result of Ukrainian interference, but actually this is another theory. Banking applications such as Alpha Bank and Sperbank also did not work. Disruptions to mobile internet were recorded by operators such as MTS, Megaphone and Beeline. Brief channels source close to the ministry's, ministry suggests that the internet restrictions in Russia are related to exercises of Roskomnadzor uh, while the, that, I think that's the communications um, government organisation while the global shutdown was associated with the testing of mechanisms of transition uh, to the sovereign internet. By the way, not so long ago, Roscom Nadzor reported the installation of up to 100% of its equipment for the technical means of counteracting threats in uh, the networks of internet service providers. This means that Roscom Nadzor controls 100% of the traffic within the country and all traffic going to and from abroad. The most dangerous period in terms of internet shutdown slowdowns in Russia is a period between the end of voting on March 17th and the official announcement of the results on March 28th. This is potentially the most convenient time for dissenters to resort to street protests, which the authorities will fight this time not only with the help of law enforcers, but also through a large-scale internet shutdown. Given that there have been no mass public protests in connection with the internet shutdowns and restrictions, this is a fairly realistic option. Right. What I want to say is this is totally plausible and Russia will need to control its population. And if there is a big turnout for if they do have this alternative, realistic alternative um, prospect for voting in the form of the anti-war 
uh, candidates, then Putin might have to deal with protests if they then come out with Putin overwhelmingly winning by filling with the stats, which is almost certainly what's going to happen. Uh, so, it, Or if they, they disallow him to stand for election based on X, Y and Z false uh, issue, then you might have protests. There might be protests to do with the war. And there might be all sorts of potential protests. Now, imagine now, any of you at home watching this or at work or wherever you are, imagine you didn't have the internet now, not just now, but for the next week. Imagine how cut off you would be. Ima think of all the con connectivity we have. I would be lost, right? I, most of my life exists through the internet, right? I, I, I very rarely phone people's phone numbers. I don't have so many people's phone numbers anymore because I contact them through WhatsApp and Facebook and Facebook Messenger and all these other, other apps. You know, people use Telegram and Signal and this and that. You don't phone people. You don't use landline telephones anymore so much. Uh, and so if the internet was shut down, imagine how difficult it would actually be to collectively get together and protest anything. How would you organize where to meet? How would you contact people? Suddenly, you're at home and you have no way of being able to mass coordinate. The power of being, to sw being able to switch off the internet is incredibly strong. Uh, like the Russians obviously are, are practicing having that. And that would surely completely uh, stop or, or largely stop the population's ability to get together and protest. It would have to be really, really organic. It would have to be really un um prepared it would have to be done without the ability to coordinate it's just this kind of analysis for me from anton gerishchenko is, is really super interesting and super important and i think the russians have that kind of control over the population and going forward that kind of dictatorial approach to um to <laughs> democracy or not is is going to be on show uh, and I think they are just getting ready. This has nothing to do with drones, but everything to do with controlling the population and controlling the outcome of the elections and any dissent that might or might not now uh, result as as uh, as a result of the, uh, the fake election that will that will take place. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Please take care. Speak soon. Toodle bits. It's been too long.